Well, good afternoon to all of you, and a happy Sabbath day. And all of those on the webcast, we're glad you're tuned in as well. And I see we have a couple of visitors. Welcome. Sorry I didn't get here in time to meet you, but maybe after services. Well, they say uh, great minds think alike. Howard, that's what they say. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> but anyway, you started your your message about Egypt. I'm going to I'm going to talk about Egypt and a little little other few other things as well. Uh, some of you are probably wondering why I got here late. I'm normally early. <laughs> uh, I have a clock in my kitchen. And it's a battery-powered clock. And for some reason, I know I, when the time changed, I know I said it correctly. And for some reason, it's, it's almost an hour late. <laughs> so I was going by that clock. To top it off, I put on my wristwatch, and I hadn't changed that when the time changed. And it said, it said the same as my, my other <laughs> clock. And I said, uh. Anyway, that's why I'm late. Okay, I'm sure we all understand by now, after uh, Howard's message, that uh, Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread are right around the corner. And uh, what I want to talk about today, I'll just give you my title, Understanding the Symbols of the Days of Unleavened, Unleavened Bread. Understanding the Symbols of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Uh, those two symbols I'm speaking of is the symbol of leaven and the symbol of Egypt as a type of sin. So I want to expand those two things today. You know, there's no Bible verse that I know of that explicitly says Egypt is a type of sin. And there's also no scripture that says leaven represents sin. But there are scriptures that are not explicit that indicate that that is true. So that's why we have to, uh, to consider the whole word of God. Most of you know that the holy days represent the plan of God. And uh, even though a lot of speakers have <clears throat> listed that plan in reference to the holy days, I'd like to read them once more. Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread picture baptism and coming out of sin, as Mr. Mark Banks told us today. Pentecost pictures first fruits and the giving of the Holy Spirit. Trumpets pictures the return of Christ and the day of the Lord, although it doesn't necessarily say Christ will return on trumpets. It's a symbol of that return. Atonement pictures the removal of sin, the removal of Satan, who is the major cause of sin. And Feast of Tabernacles pictures the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. And of course, the eighth day, uh, which many of us really like to think about, is that's when all people will have a chance to learn what you and I know. So, uh, so now we're, we're about to embark on the first one, the day Passover in the days of unleavened bread. And I've already, I remind myself a second time here that there's no explicit statement that you know, indicates uh, those two symbols represent what they do. But let's look at, let's look at some of the ways that leaven represents sin. My first point there is leaven is everywhere. And, you, and you, <laughs> you know that leaven is everywhere. It floats in the air. So it's everywhere. I, uh, in this regard, about 10 years ago, or maybe longer, I don't know, I, uh, I called the, uh, the company that makes uh, matzos for the Jews and I think it's Mana Schuetz was the one I, was the one I called, and I asked to speak to the rabbi there that was in charge of, you know, overseeing things. And 
he wasn't in, so I left a message and I told him what I wanted to know. And what I wanted to know was, I read on the internet back then, 10 years or so ago, uh, that when the Jews make matzos for Passover, they make, they make matzos for other things, but when they make it for Passover, they when they mix the special wheat or special flour and the special water, and it's, they're special in certain ways, 18 minutes after they do the mixture, they say it must be in the oven. And why, was, why must it be in the oven? Because leaven is everywhere. So leaven comes down and settles. And they say, we can't have that. It's got to be eight, 18 minutes. It's got to be in the, in the oven. So I left the message on his, uh, he wasn't there, on his uh, answering machine or whatever it was, I don't know, 10 years ago, I don't know what they had for recording, but anyway, uh, <clears throat> a little later, he called back and I was gone, so he left a message on my recorder. And he said, yes, we do observe that, except it's not 18 minutes, it's more like 13. <laughs> I mean, big deal. <laughs> but anyway, he made a big deal out of it. 13, 13 minutes or less, he said. Something like that. Anyway, uh, I guess the Jews understand that leaven is a type of sin. So they, they don't want this sin going into their matzos that they use on Passover. So that's the first, uh, <clears throat> first idea, that leaven is everywhere. And sin is the same way. It, you know, there's a scripture that's all have sinned. Romans 3, 23 says, all have sinned and come, and come short of the glory of God. And that all means me, it means you, it means everyone. Except Jesus Christ himself. All have sinned. And, and uh, so that shows you that sin is widespread. It's everywhere. We all have partaken of sin. And uh, First John one eight says, "If we say we have no sin, uh, we deceive ourselves." So uh, <clears throat> that, that proves that point for sure. The second thing I'd like to bring out is leaven grows, multiplies, and increases rapidly. Uh, in First uh, Corinthians five six, I was going to turn there, but I think for lack of time. I'll just say what it, tell you what it says. It says a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump. And I, I'm almost certain that most of you have read that before. A little leaven, leaven's a whole lump. And in the context he was speaking of, the Corinthian church had a problem there. And he's saying, if you let that, if, if you let that go, it will affect the whole church. You must take care of it. Because that's the way sin is. It leavens the whole lump. And uh, you have to take care of it so that it doesn't do that. The next point, leaven is tenacious and aggressive. And, uh, you know, once the leavening uh, process has started, it's very difficult to stop. And uh, in addition to that, even if you do stop it, the effects are already there, you know. And uh, that's, that's because leaven is so tenacious and aggressive. And uh, sin is like that. Sin has a tendency to increase and grow. It just does. Uh, let's uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 6. And I would like to read this section. 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, verse 18 through 20. First Corinthians 6, verse 18. Uh, this is after Paul had <clears throat> handled that uh, problem in Corinthians. And he says, Flee sexual immorality, verse 18, 618. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. 
but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which, which are God's. So that's saying that uh, some sins are worse than others, actually, and, and, and they are. So it's a, he, Paul begins by saying, flee immorality. That's a sin you don't ever want to be involved in because it, it, it affects so many people and it affects them very badly. The next point, leaven can be hidden and hard to find. And uh, sins are that way, you know. People who are self-righteous, do they know they're self-righteous? No, <laughs> they don't. If I'm self-righteous, do I know it? No. I mean, that's just the way sin is. It's, it's kind of... It's kind of hidden from us, and we uh, we can't discern it. Others can discern it so well, but we can't. <laughs> the last point in this section here is uh, leaven corrupts. The uh, the Hebrew word for leavening is ch chametz, C H E M E M E T Z, and it means sour or or fermented. That's why some Jews are not concerned about baking soda because it doesn't sour or ferment, and they only are concerned about yeast. Uh, some people argue with that, but we're not going to argue about that today. I'd like to read Leviticus 2 and verse 11. I'll just read it. I printed it out in my notes here. It says, No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven, and that, that's the word chametz. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. And uh, some people like to say, rather than the word Lord, like eternal, because that indicates God's character rather than just Lord. He was he's a, the eternal God. So why not burn honey? I'm not going to tell you, because I don't know. <laughs> so, I mean, if we want to discuss that in the, in the message chat, we can. But uh, I couldn't find, I'd look on the internet exactly why no honey was allowed to be burnt on the altar. And I, could, I can think of some reasons that, that they're not biblical, they're just my reasoning. So we don't, we, I don't think the Jews know as well, they don't. They they were they didn't offer a dogmatic answer either. Now I'd like to turn to Lou, uh, Luke twelve. Uh, and we're going to talk in Luke twelve. If I can find it uh, about hypocrisy. Luke 12, I'm beginning in verse 1. Hypocrisy is a, is a vehicle that people use to hide things, perhaps to hide sin. Luke 12, verse 1 says, In the, in the meantime, when an when a new, innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they tra trampled one another, he began to say to his disciples, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For, they, for there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever... You have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear and in the rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. So, uh, 
we could go to Matthew 23 and, and uh, in, in Matthew 23, uh, Christ calls the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees hypocrites about six or eight times. And I don't recall how long, how many times, <clears throat> but that's what they were. They were hypocrites. They, uh, they, you know, they put on a show that they're righteous, but you know, in back rooms, they were figuring out how to get around the law. And then what could we do to look like we were obeying this law, but get around it some way. And uh, they have lots of ways of doing that. And uh, we shouldn't do that. But uh, another thing I'd like to bring out here, and I've, I've mentioned this before years ago, that uh, the, the Greek word hypocrisy or hypocrite, I guess I should, it's not a bad word. Hypocrite in Greek just means an actor. And, uh, you know, people put, put actors on a, on a pedestal like they're some great thing. I mean, you know, some of the actors in Hollywood uh, like to talk about some of the governmental issues. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I said, who wants to listen to them? I mean, do I really care what you, what you think? <laughs> now, you're an actor. What do you know about it? But anyway, hip, hypocrisy was not a bad word in Greek, but in uh, in English we've uh, ad adopted the word. In, in in English, it is a a negative word. Someone who is a hypocrite is uh, misrepresents themselves. You know, they, uh, they say, "Oh, I'm so righteous," but uh, you know, don't don't go home and watch what happens there. You know. <laughs> uh, that's hypocrisy. Uh, also, he said uh, the leaven was hypocrisy. The the Mark in Mark's account, it's sixteen twelve. I'm not going to turn there. Uh, it says, "Beware of the doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees." The doctrine. So in that passage. He represents uh, the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees as doctrine. And uh, why did he say that? Well, uh, as we know, they, they tried to, to make changes so that they could get around obeying God's law. They, they just don't like to obey God's law. You know, for example, uh, they say you... You can't swat a fly on, on the Sabbath. That's working. You can't do that. What do you do about a mosquito? Uh, I guess you let, him, <laughs> you, let, you let him go. But anyway, it's nonsense like that. That's the, you know, they have uh, 613 commandments and, you know, God gave 10. So anyway, uh, moving on. Let's, uh, that's 11. 11 is a, is a symbol of sin. And you can see the uh, characteristics of leaven match almost perfectly sin, doesn't it? Uh, so now we let's go on to about Egypt. Why is Egypt a representation of sin? And I said here, turn to Deuteronomy 4, and I had a lot of scriptures there to read, but I'm not sure we have time to read all of those scriptures all those verses, but Deuteronomy 4, beginning in 14. Deuteronomy 4, uh, verse 14. Deuteronomy, is, the word Deuteronomy means the second giving, second giving of the law. And this was uh, <clears throat> written very likely before they entered into the promised land. It says, and the Lord commanded me at the time to teach you, speaking of Moses here, Teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them in the land which you cross over to possess. Take care, take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when you, the Lord spoke to you at Horeb in the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make yourselves carved images in the form of your of any figure, the likeness of male or female. And then uh, the rest of the verses, I'm not going to read, but you can read it later. But it talks about all about images. 
and they just came out of Egypt, and all of the all of the gods of Egypt were images. I mean, they represented their gods with images, and that's why he, why God wrote to had Moses write about not making images. And um, there's there's a little bit of irony in the, in what happened in Egypt. Well, I did want to mention that Egypt, according to some, you know, you can't say anything dogmatically about ancient times. I mean, you can you can find out what this person says and then this person says and he, he contradicts him and he adds to his and you know so you can't think, say anything much dogmatic but anyway I came across one site that said Egypt had 114 different gods now I wouldn't be surprised if they had 214 but but that's what this one <clears throat> this one site said they have 214 different gods and they had an image for every one. And uh, guess what was one of the greatest gods in Egypt? The moon. The moon was one of the greatest gods in Egypt. And, and uh, <clears throat> in Psalm 68, 4, I'll just read it for sake of time. Sing to, the God, sing to God, sing praises to his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds by his name, Yah. Y A H and rejoice before him. <clears throat> now, usually, Y A H is written Yahweh, Y A H E W is the way we spell it in English, and uh, that's a representation of the uh, Tetragrammaton, which is four letters. Yah is just three letters, not all four. It, it's sort of a shortcut or a nickname, you might say. Well, guess what they called the moon god in Egypt? They called him Yah. And uh, I, I, I told you that disclaimer because other people say, well, I don't know if it was Yah, it was this word, huh? it was this word. Uh. But anyway, uh, many people agree that Yah was one of the names of the moon god. But the moon god had a couple other names. And the reason why there's confusion is because that comes from hieroglyphics. And uh, can you read hieroglyphics? I can't. <laughs> they don't make sense to me. But some people claim they can. And uh, so that's why there's a little difference. And uh, the reason I bring that out is uh, it's because of the irony of when uh, Israel left Egypt. Uh, they left Egypt on the 15th day of the first month. So what happens on the 15th day of the first month? In the Hebrew calendar, the 15th day of every month, there's a full moon. The moon is up there and it's full. It's not, it's not a crescent, it's full on the 15th. In the Hebrew calendar, usually 13, 14, 15, and 16 all look full. But it's really full on about the 14th or 15th. And, uh, you know, astronomers today can measure that. And this year, the moon, the moon will be full on the 15th of the Hebrew month. And uh, we'll, take the, we'll take the Passover beginning on the 14th. But it's, the moon is full there. So <laughs> consider that, uh, I don't know if this is relevant or not, it's just a, thing that I thought about. Think of what happened when, when God brought Israel out of Egypt. They marched out on the night of the 15th and Numbers 33, 3 says, in the sight of all the Egyptians. And Deuteronomy 16, 1 says, they left at night. So how, how did they leave at night? And the Egyptians saw them, the full moon. The moon was shining brightly, and of course, not many clouds in Egypt. And uh, so 
it was like daylight, for, you know, in a, in a desert place, a full moon is like daylight almost. So they saw them marching out of Egypt. And uh, who was giving them the light to march out? Their God, the Egyptian God, was giving them light. Like I say, I don't know if that's that relevant or not. But consider one other thing about Egypt. Who do you suppose was the first country to use leaven to leaven bread? Egypt. Egypt. Scientists are, are, are pretty uh, agreed on this. That Egypt was the, one, was the ones who first figured out how to use yeast and make bread rise up. Now there's nothing wrong with the uh, bread that's uh, risen, it's good, <laughs> but not on the days of unleavened bread. And uh, so again, I think that's kind of ironic that Egypt, uh, I, I, I was going to use the word invented, they didn't invent it, discovered, so Egypt discovered uh, using yeast to uh, make bread rise. They also invented beer, and I kind of like beer, so it was a good idea. <laughs> anyway, that's probably uh, just a, maybe it's just a coincidence, I don't know, but it's interesting to think about. Oh, I did want to read this, <clears throat> this uh, bit about Egypt. Uh, first disco discovering uh, fermentation and yeast. It says, hieroglyphics suggest, this is a quote from a, a site called The History of Yeast. Who don't want to write about the history of e yeast? But anyway, it says, hieroglyphics suggest that the ancient Egyptians were using yeast and the process of fermentation to produce alcoholic beverages and to leaven bread over 5,000 years ago. And uh, actually other, other writers said went way back farther than that. Um, and says the, the biochemical process of fermentation that is responsible for these actions was not understood. How do they know it wasn't understood? and undoubtedly looked upon by early man as a mysterious and even a magical phenomenon. And I think that's guesswork there, but I mean, uh, you'd be surprised what the ancients knew. You'd be really surprised if you'd study it. For example, did you know that, this has nothing to do with the Passover, but you know the Romans could, could make better concrete than we can? Much better concrete than we can. They knew how to do it. As a matter of fact, that in MIT, they're studying that right now. They want to figure out how the Romans made such good concrete. And uh, they're discovering parts of it anyway. So anyway, uh, Egypt had uh, hundreds of gods and they had images and God says, don't, don't learn those images and um, of course he told us specifically not to, not to worship the sun or the moon or, or any of those kind of things. But what, is, what has Israel done and what have we done? In Hosea 8, and I'll just read this, Hosea 8 verse 11 through 13, and it says this, because Ephraim, uh, one of the major uh, tribes of Israel has made many altars for sin they have become for him altars for sinning I have written for him the great things of my law but they were considered a strange thing for the sacrifices of my offerings they sacrifice flesh and eat it but the eternal does not accept them now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins and that is says a strange thing they shall return to Egypt. This was after David was out of Egypt. And it says, they will return to Egypt. Did Israel ever return to Egypt? No, they never did. So what does this mean? Well, it means that, it means that 
they and we have returned spiritually to Egypt. And if you look at what's happening in this country of ours, you can see that. Look at what's happening. Some of the some of the oddest things are happening about, you know, transgenderism and all of that stuff. That's returning to Egypt. That's what we're doing. We're returning to Egypt. And you might say returning to Babylon. It's the same thing. They're, they're, both, they're both the same thing, really, whether it's Babylon or Egypt. But anyway, I'm out of time, so let me uh, say this. Uh, <clears throat> Zays of Unleavened Bread uh, teach us that leaven is everywhere. It grows and multiplies just in leaven or sin. It doesn't make a difference what you use. It's tenacious. It's often hidden. And it corrupts. Sin will corrupt us if we let it grow and multiply. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 16, Paul writes this in uh, <clears throat> closing this particular section of his. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God as God has said I will dwell in them and walk among them I will be their God and they shall be my people therefore come out from among them and be separate says the eternal do not touch which is unclean that which is unclean and I will receive you so <clears throat> we need to learn the lessons of unleavened bread Passover and unleavened bread, and uh, make sure that uh, we how does it, as it examine ourselves. That is the word I was trying to think. We need to examine ourselves to make sure that that hidden sin is not within us, and uh, be ready for the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. <clears throat>